Reading 28 from the Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Yuspinsky by Dr. Maurice Nichol. Volume 3. Cormid Uglay, April 27, 1946. Commentary on Attitudes. We have not spoken for some time about attitudes. In the last paper, we spoke about false personality and imaginary I. It was said that these two work conceptions are different, yet sometimes they come close together. I will review briefly, in a slightly different way, the difference between false personality and imaginary I. False personality is that which gives you an entirely unreal existence and only attracts to you unreal things. It makes you identify with what is not yourself. On one occasion, I was talking to Mr. Uspinski about this, and he said, It is a great handicap to have a long line of descent. I asked him why this was, and he said that people identify with their ancestors, and yet they themselves are born into the world completely free from ancestors. That is, their real essence comes into the world quite apart <clears throat> from the conditions into which it is born. In so many words, he added, if you feel pride in your origin in time and space, you will never get to your real self. I remember that he repeated to me twice that we have to understand that we are not born through our parents, but that our essence comes down from the stars as something quite independent of our origin. In other words, what we have to understand is that in self-remembering, we do not remember our ancestry or even our parents. We came down from an entirely different source. If you want to see what false personality is like, listen to two charwomen talking together. One of them says that her grandpapa had a house of his own and lived in style. The other one will perhaps say that her grandmother had ten years penal servitude and was in the papers. This curious thing called false personality can actually make us feel that we are somebody because we had at one time or another a very distinguished, very notorious ancestor who committed several crimes and gave the police a great deal of trouble. False personality is a very extraordinary thing to study both in yourself and in other people. Now, as regards imaginary I, it was said that imaginary I is the imagination that you are always one and the same person, and that you speak consciously on every occasion, that you know what you are doing, and in fact that you can do. Now we pass to the question of attitudes. All this work consists in separating oneself from one's unreal eyes. False personality is one unreal side of us and only attracts unreal things. Imaginary eye also attracts unreal things. But in this work of separating oneself from what is unreal, the work teaches many accessory ideas to which we have to apply self-observation. Attitudes are unreal things in us. Each one of you has certain ingrained attitudes or points of view, from which you regard everyone else and also regard yourself. They are chiefly connected with false personality. Let me give you an example of an attitude. A man has acquired an attitude which makes him think himself in some way superior to certain people. When he meets these people, his attitude operates mechanically in him. He does not like these people. Yes, but he does not like them from attitude from mechanicalness. Suppose that I try to make this particular man see the value of some people towards whom he has this mechanical attitude. I introduce him to them. I begin to talk about them, what they have done, what they have been through, and so on. After a time, he unbends. He is very surprised to find that these people are not at all what he thought they were. He will find they are quite interesting people. What is happening to such a man? What is happening is that one has got round his mechanical attitude through which he cannot take in new impressions, and one has, so to speak, undermined him. Undermined him in what? Undermined his false personality, his negative and restricting attitude, 
and freed him therefore from part of his mechanical acquired side. This man will now feel freer. The very expression of his face will begin to change. His way of talking will change, and instead of feeling any loss, he will feel a sense of gain. On one occasion, Mr. Uspinsky was talking to me about attitudes. He said that attitudes are very difficult things to observe in oneself. He said they are laid down very early in us through our acquired psychology, through what we have been taught and they are, practically speaking, always negative attitudes. He said that what people call a good education is what gives a person typical negative attitudes, and when these negative attitudes have been properly implanted, this young person is said to be properly educated. He said that in English education, as far as he knew, great emphasis was laid on boys and girls in growing up getting good negative attitudes, and that is far as he could see, that was the only education that was given. On one occasion I suggested that some of us should sing him some English sea shanties. I was standing near him at the time, and he smiled at me and looked at me and said, Most of these people have been brought up with typical negative attitudes. How could they possibly sing sea shanties? I could not bear sea shanties sung with an Oxford accent. Now negative attitudes become gradually fixed in us and then become buffers. A typical negative attitude, unless one escapes from it, gradually settles down as it were and becomes crystallized out as a buffer. Once it has become a buffer, it is very difficult to see. A buffer, I will remind you, is that which prevents us from seeing contradictions in ourselves. That is why a well-buffered man is often such a success in life. He appears to have a strong will. His buffers prevent him from seeing anything wrong with him, and yet such a man, from the work point of view, is a very weak man. He is very low down in the scale of being. Sometimes people have brought to me people for this work, and I have seen that they have very strong buffers. Then I know that it will be practically impossible to teach this work to them, because they are too weak inside. That is, they have nothing behind their facade of buffers which keep them in good humor with themselves. And if one should try to destroy a buffer in such people, they might literally go mad because they have nothing internal, nothing behind them, nothing real. In this work, we begin with the idea of impersonal self-study. That is, we begin with the idea that we have to obtain knowledge of our being. This can only begin, obviously, by means of turning round and looking into ourselves consciously, noticing how we speak and behave, and so on. This is a movement inwards. Only in this way can a man begin to separate himself from himself. One part of this practice of conscious self-study is to observe our attitudes. When we reach the point of being able to observe attitudes to a small extent, this actually starts something going in us, which may lead to something strange, to new thoughts and feelings. So it is said that this work begins with self-observation. We, none of us, know that we have attitudes. In general, we all take ourselves for granted just as we are, and so never see that this is what we are. That is, that our state of being attracts what happens to us the whole time. How many of you have ever realized that things are your fault? This is quite an easy thought if you take it sentimentally and pathetically. We surely all know this spurious form of self-blame, but what I mean is, how many of you have ever seen, in a stark naked way, without any self-justifying, that something was entirely your fault, and that, in so many words, thou art the man? Because we have this peculiar illusion about ourselves, which is called hypnotic sleep. In the work, we do not imagine that we have any particular attitudes. Now, as was said, our attitudes are practically always negative attitudes by means of which we distinguish ourselves from other people and so stimulate this false conception of ourselves called false personality. 
Mr. Uspinski once said, we must get to observe and know all our negative attitudes. We may, in a sense, observe our negative attitudes, but we take them as being perfectly right. But, he added, the point here is that we really do not see that they are attitudes implanted in us by our education and by imitation, and that they are not really ourselves at all, he said. We must not only observe, but know well in our memory what our attitudes are, definitely and permanently. And he added, negative attitudes never pay, they simply make you empty. And when we once realize this, we have no right and no excuse for identifying with them. On another occasion, he said, attitudes never think. They work automatically. They are like hard places in the intellectual center, like crystallized thoughts. And since they are practically always negative, they finally become buffers. He once asked me, how do you know when a person is speaking from fixed attitudes? I said I did not know, and he said, you should know it at once. You become bored. You begin to yawn when a man is speaking from fixed opinion. He is not thinking. Now attitudes are laid down in the intellectual center, and they take the place of real individual thinking. They affect the emotional center, but their starting point is in the intellectual center. If you see a person full of acquired attitudes and nothing else, you will feel at once that it is impossible to speak to this person. That is, you cannot free his thinking from these acquired attitudes. On another occasion, Mr. Uspinski said, If you are full of negative attitudes, you will never be able to get in touch with any of the higher parts of centers in yourself, and so not with any higher level of being. He gave an illustration. He said, When you have a great many negative attitudes of which you are quite unaware, and which you have accepted as being you, it is just as if you have an enormous number of overcoats, and you keep on wearing all these overcoats all the time, and so it is impossible to reach you. In such a case, he added, a man cannot pass through the narrow way of this work, which is a question of inner sincerity. He will not be able to get through the doors and narrow passages unless he begins to discard all these overcoats that he knows nothing about and takes as himself. I would add that you may be able to observe attitudes in other people fairly well, and we know when a person is speaking from a typical attitude. It is certainly tiresome. It is far more difficult to observe typical attitudes in oneself, and yet this has to be done. You can notice it partly by watching your intonation. This is one way out of many. When you are speaking from attitude, you will notice that you are speaking in a flat, dead voice. You will notice this in other people, so try to see it in yourself. Then you may begin to see how ordinarily your life is made perhaps so unhappy because of these attitudes which you have acquired and never seen through. <laughs>